Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> and welcome to this open forum with Dr. Jody Halperin, our 2014 Curtis R. Holtzgang Visiting Scholar. Uh, this lectureship was named for Dr. Holtzgang, who has joined us again and was here this morning for Grand Rounds. And Dr. Holtzgang is the retired director of uh, critical care medicine and was a key pivotal person in ethics education at Providence. He also was um, central to the founding of the Providence Center for Healthcare Ethics. Um, before I introduce Dr. Halperin, I wanted to share a reflection with you in the tradition of Providence. So just asking us all to take a moment and pause. And I thought this reflection was particularly appropriate given our topic today. And it's called You and I. You and I, we meet as strangers, each carrying a mystery within us. I cannot say who you are. I may never know who you are. I may never know completely. But I trust that you are a person in your own right, possessed of a beauty and value that are the Earth's greatest treasures. So I make a promise to you. I will impose no identities upon you, but will invite you to become yourself without shame or fear. I will hold open a space for you in the world and allow your right to fill it with authentic vocation and purpose. For as long as the search takes, you have my loyalty. I had the great pleasure of meeting and la later hearing Dr. Halperin at the 2014 Kinsman Conference. I found her keynote address on clinical empathy, which she also shared this morning at Grand Rounds, very thought-provoking and personally moving. In fact, I've thought about the case she shared with us many times since. I was struck by her ability to weave together psychology medical ethics, and her own experiences working with patients to challenge us and inspire us to offer deeply compassionate and truly patient-centered care. Dr. Halpern is a psychiatrist with a doctorate in philosophy. She is an associate professor of bioethics and medical humanities in the School of Public Health and the Joint Medical Program at the University of California, Berkeley. Her work focuses on clinical empathy, health decisions and patient autonomy, and social reconciliation and social justice. Dr. Halpern's book, From Detached Concern to Empathy, Humanizing Medical Practice, is used in medical and nursing schools around the world. And I really recommend that book if you get a chance to read it. It is invaluable. In this session, Dr. Halpern will be presenting for about 35 minutes, mostly focusing on a case and then is going to join a panel discussion. She's going to be joined by Dr. Nick Cockler, who's a senior ethicist at the Providence Center for Healthcare Ethics, and Marsha Rice, who's an RN and a day charge nurse in the CICU. Uh, Marsha's also been thought deeply and presented on ethics for many years. Um, they'll be reflecting on Dr. Halperin's presentation from the Providence perspective. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Halperin. Thank you, Barbara, for that lovely introduction. If I'm over here, can you still hear me? I just, this is a little bit different mic now here. Let's see. How's that? Is that fine for everybody? And I want to um, thank Dr. Holzgang. And uh, we talked about it a bit this morning, but I've heard a lot of wonderful stories. And I know that his em empathy and his work with patients inspires all of you, and including um, people who have helped donate and create the center here. It's an incredible contribution. And uh, it's an honor to be here today. And I want to thank the folks from the Ethics Center. Um, I'm, already, I'm really enjoying my time here already. It's really a great pleasure. So, so to this, this talk this afternoon uh, is about the, uh, the way a whole team, a whole clinical care group can get caught up in emotional projections where a patient is suddenly seen in a very narrow way, and that can lead to medical mistakes. And uh, or just and basically nursing and and care errors. Uh, so let me present a case to you that um, 
involves, it, it was written up by Francis Degnam in the Journal of Clinical Ethics. I can give people the reference in 2009. And the first of three, I'm going to read the case in three parts. The very first part is Degnan's words, not my words. And then I'm going to pause after I read that and give us a moment to reflect on some issues, then read the second part, pause, give us a moment to reflect, and then read the last part, and then present some analysis, and then we'll work together as a panel. Lois, an elderly resident of a long-term care facility for mature adults, arrives with a history of cardiac disease, headaches, and severe arthritis. She had no local family. The most troubling of her conditions, at least from the staff perspective, was a history of depression and severe anxiety. Prior to coming to the home, she had been hospitalized for depression and anxiety three times, each precipitated by a significant life event, such as the death of her father. Lois had shopped from physician to physician, seeking help for real and imagined complaints, taking up excessive time and often failing to follow courses of treatment. While, while many of her physical complaints were real, Lois was also seeking company. She repeatedly complained of loneliness and lack of friendships. And her neediness, anxiety, and negative attitudes and lack of compliance tended to drive away the very people from whom she sought help. When she didn't feel that her needs were being met, she became demanding and distrustful. One physician reported her as calling either our office or the triage nurse or my phone line two to three times per day for a period of weeks. Often this was with physical complaints. She would sometimes arrive at a physician's office with pages of handwritten notes, but she also repeatedly complained about how the staff ignored her. As a result, Lois arrived at the care facility on a large number of medications, rotating on and off them without proper supervision, including a large number of anxiety and psychiatric medications, including Xanax, Ativan, Paxil, Trazodone, Axazepam, Effexor, Haldol, and Zoloft, although not all at the same time, <laughs> some of which could interact with many of other dozens of medications she rotated on and off for her other conditions. In the beginning, I mean, we all laugh, but it's actually the core of the case is how much anxiety medication she was being given, which does happen, we all know. In the beginning, she was allowed to administer her own medications, but due to her lack of compliance, many of her critical medications were eventually admit, uh, administered by the nursing staff. Lois would barrage the staff with needs, and while this led to more attention in the short run, it led to them avoiding her in the long run. This triggered her loneliness and anger, which then increased her demands. When the team tried to rationalize and reduce her meds, she would initially become so anxious that her needs for the clinicians would increase. Often the team simply gave her all the meds she demanded just to reduce spending time with her. So the first question I'd like you to reflect upon for a minute, and maybe take some notes to yourself, because we're going to discuss this, these things at the panel, is how would you break this vicious cycle of anger, demands, avoidance, and over-medication? So let's take a minute or two to think about this in, silently. Okay. Lois has a very difficult personality type for caregivers. She's not only circumstantially alone, but she has a style of dependency that made her needs seem endless. Providers can find this overwhelming and ultimately avoid her, which increases her anxiety. In her case, what began to break the cycle was the intervention of a longtime neighbor of Lois's, Mary. Lois contacted Mary and asked her if she would agree to perform the du duties for her durable power of attorney for health care. Mary did not know Lois well, and she was surprised to get the request and said she wasn't sure about taking it on, but she was a kind person and she realized how alone Lois was. She began visiting Lois regularly. She came up with a firm and reliable set of arrangements with Lois. No phone calls at work, but rather Lois was to hold her concerns until Mary's scheduled visits, which were frequent and short in duration. This calmed Lois considerably, and she was able to reduce her anxiety meds consistently. However, things came to a head on a day when Lois was expecting a visit from a friend in another state. 
the, the friend who she viewed as almost a daughter had recently had a child, and Lois wanted to give her a present. When Lois asked the facility to withdraw $500 from her residential account as a gift, Lois was told that there was no money in her account. Lois became agitated. At first, she was upset about just not being able to her, give her friend the gift for the baby. But as time went on, her fears became increasingly irrational, progressing from fears that her money had been stolen to fears that she might be put out on the street. The staff members were unable to calm her. The team leader, at her wit's end, said, Lois, said that Lois needed to be put back on stronger sedating medications and even remarked at one point that she needed to be sedated for, for two months or put in a, a psychiatric hospital. But as the team leader calmed down, she then said, well, what we do need to do is get a psychiatric consultation. The leader said that the consultation was to see if Lois could be admitted to a psychiatric hospital where her anxiety meds could be rapidly increased. In addition to this episode, the team leader noted that Lois had shown many other examples or other examples of erratic behavior. The main one that she brought up was that Lois was stealing newspapers from other residents' rooms, even though she received a daily edition of the same paper. She also brought up that Lois was, had been calling the doctors previously at home. So second thing for you to reflect about for a minute is if you were this team leader, <laughs> What would you hope to get out of a psychiatric consultation? Would you also be thinking that the, the goal would be for the psychiatrist to admit Lois uh, to the hospital, to a psychiatric hospital, or would you have other goals as well? So think, let's think about that for a minute, <coughs> silently, and we'll discuss it later. Okay. Before she went for the psychiatric consultation, Lois called Mary. Mary came in and spoke with the team leader, who told Mary that the entire staff was frustrated with Lois's behavior. But when Mary reflected back the term frustrated, the team leader then changed her statement from frustrated to concerned. Mary told the team leader that she would accompany Lois to the psychiatrist. During the psychiatric visit, Mary was able to help Lois to express her concerns, particularly her frustration over not being able to get a straight answer or perhaps not being able to hear it about her missing funds. While the psychiatrist asked, when the psychiatrist asked Lois about taking the newspapers, Lois explained that she had an agreement with several, several other residents of uh, this, uh, uh, this, she was in the healthier part of this uh, elder community, and there was also a nursing home part for people that had very limited mobility, and she was collecting the newspapers and bringing them to the people in the nursing home on a daily basis. In other words, it was an act of charity. Similarly, Lois admitted that she had called the staff at home, but said she made those calls only if the caregiver would give her their home number, but she was able to acknowledge the inappropriateness of these calls. Moreover, Mary was able to report how she'd handled the problem of Lois's call to her, call to her and how the strategy had corrected the problem. Lois knew not to call Mary at work and that Mary would see her very regularly. Following the interview, the psychiatrist concluded that Lois did not need any additional anxiety medications. He told Mary that he was deeply impressed by how well Lois was doing and said this was the best he'd seen Lois in years. He had seen her previously. He further concluded that while Lois was a negative person with personality disorders, someone she trusted could talk her down. When Lois was feeling out of control, a major trigger for her anxiety, a strategy of empowering her, setting limits, and reassuring was more, were more altogether was more appropriate than medication. Finally, he recommended that the staff work with her to develop trust and to allow her to express her needs and ask questions when she appeared confused. Following the psychiatric, psychiatrist's recommendation, the staff implemented the strategies that, that, that they had come up with, and it's similar to what Mary was doing and improvements in the trust and coping strategies allowed the staff to help Lois cope better with her own anxiety. Uh, now, this doesn't mean that Lois became an easy client, but before the stroke that eventually led to her death, Lois became an active and valuable member of the community, developing friendships, going to church, and participating in activities. 
Mary also helped Lois understand and feel secure about her finances. In fact, Lois's primary care physician referred to her relationship with Mary as the best medication that Lois could possibly have found. What is problematic is the fact that without Mary's intervention, the outcome could, could likely have been very different. Okay, so this case is an important wake-up call. It gives us a chance as caregivers to reflect on how group dynamics that we're unconscious of can, can influence our treatment decisions, especially when caring for more dependent or demanding or anxious patients. Lois's extreme anxiety and intrusive behaviors, call it, you know, bother, going to the nurse's station constantly, calling doctors on their cell phones, all of that, understandably evoked a wish to get rid of her or at least quiet her down on the part of the team. However, as you can see, this sets off a vicious cycle. The team becomes somewhat avoidant, and as they become avoidant, she becomes more anxious and then more demanding. So they were in a bad spiral. She perceived their wish to get rid of her, and that made her more frightened and insecure. Unfortunately, the doctors and nurses, in this case, and often are unaware of their own avoidance behaviors. It's very interesting how all of us um, miss the, the, many times the cases in which we manage difficult patients by just kind of avoiding them. And I have so many stories, but I'll just tell you one really quickly. I'm a psychiatrist, so I supervise psychiatrists who are learning how to do 50-minute sessions. And one of the people I was supervising told me this example where she was having a session with this man that... Uh, said several things in the session that made her feel very uncomfortable and anxious. Um, not to the point of safety or anything, but just she knew she was anxious, but she thought she was handling it really well. And she ended the session, and he left, and then he knocked on the door, and she opened the door, and he said to her, that, you know, he didn't, he hated to bother her, but she had ended the 50-minute session 20 minutes early. <laughs> she, and she had no idea. She just ended it after 30 minutes without knowing she was doing that. And this happens to all of us. It's important to accept that as human beings, we as caregivers too have our own unconscious responses to patients. In this case, consider the pivotal moment in Lois's care when Lois wanted to give $500 to her daughter-like friend, but she was told she didn't have any money in her account, and she became very agitated and the staff couldn't calm her down. The head nurse just fed up at this point, literally made the statement that Lois should be put on strong sedating medications, not for 24 hours, but for two months. Now, of course, she didn't do that, but you all know, and everybody with a nursing background and other caregivers, how highly irregular that would be, right? When we put people on, when we use sedatives to restrain people, it's only usually when they're a danger, immediate danger to self or others, and we constantly check in 24 hours, et cetera. So even that was obviously an expression of a kind of wish. And that's what I want to look into now. If you... Uh, um, humor me, I want to go as a psychiatrist into the sort of fantasy level of that wish and, and bring in the thoughts of a psychoanalyst, but one who's, I think, very down to earth, D.W. Winnicott, who was a pediatrician before he became a psychoanalyst, and he writes about children and families in a way that does involve unconscious fantasy, but also tries to be very practical. And he talks about how all caregiving relationships involve ambivalence. Uh, and, and he talks about how this is relevant uh, to clinicians, but also to parents, that when, or to people caring for dependent elders. But any time that someone is utterly dependent on you, it engenders, he uses the words love and hate. I wouldn't use the word hate because that sounds like it's a kind of a very destructive thing. But the, what he means by hate is that if you're caregiving and you feel very uh, pressured to caregive someone, there'll be a time where you want to kind of ruthlessly get rid of them, at least get a break in a kind of ruthless way. That's what he means by hate. So he gives the example of how even very good mothers, if they have a, a, a you know a very an infant with a lot of demands, um, have an unconscious wish at times to get rid of the infant. And and that that wish is communicated in the very well-known lullabies in which things happen like babies falling out of trees. So <laughs> basically, we have a very deep unconscious dynamic to sometimes get a break. And uh, just, just like psychiatrists, you know, ending the session early. 
And I think it can be very difficult for us as clinicians, as, and I think especially for nurses, because they're expected to be, you know, just as we expect more sometimes for sexist reasons, and there's a lot of male nurses, and may, maybe many here today, but professions, just like we expect sometimes too much from mothers, there's something about this infinitely giving woman or something in our unconscious. And it can be really part of the culture of nursing to not want to say that you really want to get rid of your, your duties at times. But it's definitely, you can see it with social workers and doctors too. And you could see it with this whole group. I mean, they were just worn out with, with you know, with Lois. And uh, I think it's not too far-fetched to say that they may have had a shared, un the whole team may have had a shared unconscious fantasy view of Lois as a kind of inconsolable baby. She was just always needing them and needing them. And if you were, if you had an inconsolable baby and you're a good mom, you only have one way to get a break, which is to put the baby to sleep. And I think that was behind that slip of wishing that she could be sedated for two months. And I'm just suggesting that you play with that idea. <clears throat> In any case, there was some kind of fixed view of Lois as a very infantilized person and not really uh, seeing that she was also an adult, an elder adult who had capacities, and that somehow got lost in this whole mix. And I talked this morning about the need for empathic curiosity and how important it is that as caregivers, we not only give of ourselves in all the generous ways that this nursing staff and others were giving, but that we cultivate a habit of being curious about what we're not getting about our patients. So nobody is ever just one way. So if a patient just seems unbelievably dependent and clingy, we have to become curious about, don't they really have any independent part? Isn't there more to this? Why do they appear to be such a baby? And also, Lois was doing these erra erratic behaviors, but there wasn't enough curiosity about why was she doing these things? So, for example, in this case, first of all, the fact that she wanted the money to take care of a daughter-like friend who had just had her own baby was very adult-like of Lois, but that wasn't somehow really understood. Secondly, the fact that Lois had no family and was completely providing for herself and found out that all the money in her bank account was temporarily at least gone, the fact that that would really scare her is something that I think there could have been more empathic engagement with. And I think what the most ex uh, interesting example of all of a lack of empathic curiosity is that the nursing staff didn't, it never occurred to them that she was stealing the newspapers for a good reason. You know, they didn't even, there was no clue that she was doing this charitable thing for the, the more nursing and bedridden patients. So when, when, uh, so all her mature motives in other ways, that she wasn't an inconsolable baby, were just blind, you know, blindsided. Now, notice when Lo when Lois did ultimately improve, in fact, she was able to understand and manage her finances. And we, we heard that while she wasn't an easy client, once she was treated with more adult responsibilities, she was an active and valuable member of the community. So, the last few minutes of my talk. So we have time for open forum and discussion. I think this is a good example of consultation as bringing, why it's useful sometimes to have somebody outside the group think of a healthcare team involved in looking at a case. And uh, basically, I think the whole group caring for Lois because they were on, they were on, you know, it was their job day in and day out to care for her. And I bet that was really draining. Um, they had kind of formed this group view of her as I think this infantile, you know, impossibly demanding person. Um, and that's, I think, the content potentially of what they were seeing her as, but I, I haven't said enough about the process of why groups come up with just one view sometimes, although I think this happens in medical teams a lot. And uh, the term group think has been used a lot in literature on all kinds of work teams, including the people at NASA that worked on the space shuttle Challenger to talk about why they didn't look into certain engineering problems that they should have noticed. But what happens basically is when you're part of a tight knit group, like a clinical team, there's a lot of pressure to either go along with the leader or to fit in with the group or to not make waves or to not make the work more difficult. And these pressures combined with the shared feeling of being overwhelmed by this difficult task can lead people to come up with a kind of unconscious and sometimes conscious shared stereotypical view of a patient. 
and we're going to talk more about that. I don't want to steal any of your thunder, but one of the things that Nick mentioned is often when he's called for a consult, there'll be terms, and you're going to talk about that probably, that people use, like this patient, where you can see that people have already started to think about people in a certain way. So what Mary did in this case is she played a critical role because she didn't have the duties of having to take care of Lois all the time, so she didn't have that unconscious pull towards cohering and helping the whole ship not sink so that she could sort of see things with some fresh eyes. And she also could set limits. She didn't feel guilty because she wasn't a professional caregiver. She didn't feel guilty for setting limits right away about when to be called and not. And of course, I think Lois was probably on better behavior with Mary as well, right? So that's part of it too. But it seems like in a way, Mary, even though she was a friend and she wasn't an actual consultant, like a social worker or a patient advocate or a psychiatrist, she wasn't a professional consultant, but I think she served that role. And I think that she met with Lois on a regular basis, showing that she could provide ongoing support, but like I said, also set limits to the, how much support that would be. And that seemed to have been very important. So what can we glean from this case for future team consultations? If Winnicott is right, then having a strong sense of responsibility for someone engages unconscious ambivalence. And if we're not free to acknowledge that and reflect upon this, there will often be problematic projections. Also, I just want to mention, I talked about this some this morning, that basic psychology research shows that when we have a lot of concern about someone, if we're in a conflict with them, it can be actually harder to see their distinct perspective. So it was probably harder for the nursing staff taking care of Lois every day to be genuinely curious about Lois's motives because of their concern to keep her from getting even in worse shape. So, and that's true of parents, doctors, social workers, nurses, you, you name it. Um, so conscientious caregivers are in a bind where I talked about where becoming curious can help, but in this case I'm suggesting, because it was a group think, there needed to be a little bit of a new set of eyes just to get things going. Um, and, and I was thinking about how can you do that if you don't have an outside consultant? And I was thinking about how another thing that can be done is that the group leader can, um, the, the head nurse in this case, can develop a practice in rounds or whatever in presentations or case conferences to create a culture where it's expected that not everybody on the team will have the same point of view, where it's routinely thought well of to go around the table and disagree or have new perspectives about a patient or a family. You can kind of acculturate that in a team where it becomes acceptable to have some different perspectives just all along. So when you're in a difficult case, that's more of the norm. You can also help the team when it's not in the middle of a difficult case and milder cases get used to the idea that caregiving is so exhausting that of course we're gonna be ambivalent at times and express some of those things. I think that we're going to get to talk a lot more about what teams can do and what all of you who work in the trenches have to say about this case. So that's why it's an open forum, including disagreeing with anything I've said. Um, but I just want to conclude by just summarizing that Lois was an overly demanding, difficult woman under one regimen of care and a more independent and comprehensible person under another. And it wasn't pills alone that caused this transition. I, as a psychiatrist often called in to give meds, I really feel, you know, I have a, a kind of a pet peeve because often it isn't meds that are the most effective way to manage anxiety. And not to say that they can't help, but that's just not sufficient. Um, so it actually, in a weird way, gives me a lot of hope, this case, because we live in a time where people are always looking for technological fixes, but all the people in this room who are actual care providers know that there's limits to what we can do with technology. But I actually think that we can... We've underutilized some of what we can do with our own humanity and our own curiosity, and so this is a good case where that made a big difference. Thank you. So, yeah. Just, we'll discuss. Thank you, Dr. Halpern. Uh, I'm Nick. This is Marsha. Uh, pleasure to be here with you all t this afternoon. Um, I would like to go back to a couple of the questions that you uh, posed to the audience. And, uh, and the first question was, how would you break the cycle? And this is not a rhetorical question. I'm not known for being rhetorical, <laughs> I hope. Um, how would, and 
to the audience, how would you, how would you break that cycle of anxiety, uh, um, uh, demanding needs, and avoidance, uh, and you're that team leader? How would you, how would you think about breaking that cycle? Oh, we do have a microphone, sorry. Oh, I can talk loud. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been in that exact role, but just as a primary care doctor, it's very common for us to decide that the patients that we least want to see, we have to see more often. Um, and, and you can just see the dread in the resident's face when, the, <laughs> when their preceptor actually suggests that. Um, and it's just, I mean, it just gives you a pit in your stomach, but you know that, that that's actually the first place because you're not connecting, you're missing something, and sometimes you just need to spend more time with them to get mm -hmm. to know them. And, you know, sort of the teaching about somatization is just that they need to not have a reason to come see you. Hmm. Thank you. I do find it interesting that, um, and I believe it was, I first learned of it in Dr. James Grove's article, um, that the patients who might display a certain pattern of behavior that push us away are paradoxically most afraid of losing that connection. And uh, how can we catch ourselves uh, when, we're, when we're feeling that sense of avoidance? When I look at Lois's behavior, it's pretty obvious to me that her needs are not being met. So if I was a team leader, I would have a session and talk about what are her needs? What is she trying to um, meet? She's got all these strategies that are not working. And so can we figure out the need? And to me, she had a need for trust and uh, for connection. And I don't know how to say this, but positive regard. She wants to be seen as an individual. She was seen more as a pest. Um, people were avoiding her. She's afraid of losing herself, I would say. Um, I, I think you said presence. Uh, so those would be the things that I would focus on and see if we could institute some strategies that would meet her needs because she just keeps coming up with behaviors um, that aren't meeting them. And she'll do that till the cows go home until we finally figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. so. It reminds me of that quote that I think is attributed to Albert Einstein that insanity is, what is it, that doing the same thing over, over and over and expecting a different result. I, I just want to pick up, too, because, uh, you know, this is the Ethics Center, and we're very aware that a, a big thing in bioethics is respect for autonomy. And there's a lot of really important work looking back that, you know, respect for autonomy is just one part of respect for persons. And people literally need to be treated with respect. So I love what you said, because especially elders, you know, to be treated like you're, you know, a, an infant pest, to be literally disrespected that way is, is, very, um, is, is very humiliating. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm a nurse, and I've encountered many Lewises in my 20-year <laughs> career as a nurse. And I found out that, um, as she was saying, that active listening is the key because sometimes they do have needs um, that can be can be resolved from active listening and not just medications. I know we give Haldol all the time. Night Chef always gives it just to calm on the patient, but during the day there are many ways we can elevate their suffering or their anxiety or their calling constantly by just sitting down for even just five minutes watching TV with them or something because they just need that moment of just having another person there, especially in that case, she's, she doesn't have anybody, which is very, very common. Um, I appreciate what you talked about this morning when you said how our um, conflicts that we have with people really becomes about our own need and our own kind of desire to avoid or take care of what we're feeling. And it reminds me, I had a clinical supervisor who I used to uh, talk to about ethical challenges and difficult patients, and her question to me always was, what would you do if they were normal? 
And that's something I often say over and over again to myself. When there's a patient, I don't want to follow up with them. I already met with them. I want it to be done. But then I have to say, well, what would I do if they were normal? Well, I'd follow up with them. So it's, it's kind of a silly mantra, but it's something I often use in these challenging situations. Thank you. I, I, um, <clears throat> you know, you mentioned the, uh, my comments about clinical ethics consultation, and your comment made me, uh, reminded me of um, quite often we're, we're called or paged when there's a difficult patient. And, uh, you know, I, in my ethics training, I, never, I didn't learn about vitamin H deficiency until <laughs> I uh, started working in healthcare. Um, but I have to ask, what makes it difficult? What makes this person difficult? And to, to take a step back, and, 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 and I, I play the role of a clinician. I'm not actually a clinician. But I like to think of a differential diagnosis for why an encounter with a patient is difficult. And running through you know, a, a list like, you know, are there any neurologic or psych, psychiatric uh, <laughs> issues that are unmet or unaddressed? Are there any cultural or linguistic barriers that we haven't attended to? Are there any psychosocial stressors that would be motivating the patient to behave in a certain way? Are there any systemic barriers like access to care or logistical barriers like an inability to get PTO in order to attend a family meeting on a Thursday afternoon? Um, and by and large, uh, running through that list, you end up realizing that it's not the patient that's difficult, it's the circumstances or something about the circumstances of the clinical encounter that are difficult. And so I think that the shorthand is, if the patient was normal, what would I do, I think is a shorter hand version of that. Um, thank you for your comment. And sometimes it's just that uh, the patients get labeled in nursing. You'll go into report and they'll say, this patient is difficult or this family is difficult. And so then if you're the person going, nurse going out there to take care of them, you have this preconceived difficulty, whereas had they not laid that, you could have dealt, developed your own relationship and maybe found out what the problem was. So sometimes it's because of this labeling that we all do, or they come in um, because they have a history of ETOH or drugs or something like that, so we label them. And we will miss things that are going on with them because we're not really looking to why they're acting this way. So the why, the why is the curiosity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm uh, just a resident, so you don't have to take what I say seriously. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we can learn a lot from Mary in this case. I think she was... Um, a huge help to Lois and I think what you said that Mary did that I want to bring into my practice is that she uh, listened to her as a person so she was viewed as a patient she was viewed as a resident but never as a person and I think that unique perspective really helped Lois to understand what she was and the other thing that Mary did that was very helpful and can prevent staff exhaustion is she established barriers, boundaries didn't she and so I think that that was really helpful she said I care about you and I want to meet with you once a week, but I can't get a phone call from you every day. And I think that that's what Dr. Leonard was saying about just seeing your patients more often can actually be a lot, very time saving in the long run. And I think that's something that we could do to break the cycle is just to, again, humanize the person and not view them as a patient sometimes. A question in the middle. Oh. Go ahead, sir. In our office, I've been practicing for about 39 years. Oh, in our office, I practiced for about 39 years in ophthalmology, but I had previous experience in, uh, I'd say, intensive psychiatric help. When I was in medical school in Cincinnati under Maurice Levine, who was a psychiatrist head of our department, and we always kind of amongst ourselves, if we can gossip a little bit, would say that the only psychiatrist that were worth a damn was a pediatric psychiatrist, because they listened. <laughs> and we could communicate with them. And the rest of them, we had to do their physical exams for them. <laughs> and another point, uh, we had a very few problem patients in our office. And I tried to tell the patients uh, the situation to the, to the girls that are working in our office. They're God's children. Be patient. Understand them. 
to that end, I had a, a patient that came in very angry. It wasn't our patient, but she became our patient. And she was just using a lot of energy of everybody. And Elsie was ready to cry. And I said, Elsie, you're a wonderful person. Don't let her do that to you. You know, and she was really kind to her, very nice. And two weeks later, the patient came back with a bag of animal cracker cookies. <laughs> a mo extra moment spent got to the patient's heart. Uh, to next comment about sometimes getting called for difficult. I remember one a physician and went through the whole story, and I said, "So, what exactly do you want eth ethics to do?" <laughs> and she said, "Well, fix it." <laughs> <laughs> so just as a keep your expectations realistic. Um, but w one question, I guess, for the panel, but actually for for everybody, um, and I've never done a study on this, but it seems to me sometimes difficult families or difficult patients, the conversation shifts to stewardship of resources. And so we stop talking about the family and the patient, and now the, now the discussion is, well, we're wasting resources. And now we're not talking about the people anymore. And I don't know if other people see that in, in their experience as well. And is that to change the subject so we don't feel guilty about not liking them because it's not about them anymore? And if it's not about them anymore, then we probably removed ourselves even more from that, uh, that curiosity of, of which you speak. Mm -hmm. So I've just got it, I, I know thinking back, sometimes difficult situations turn into stewardship conversations. And uh, I, I'm going to suspect that's not a good thing. But I don't know if other people experience that as well. We, we changed the conversation to make it maybe more manageable. I don't know if this is true in all circumstances, but I wonder if sometimes the shift to stewardship uh, or distribution of resources is a way of rationalizing not spending time with the patient. Um, that we need to create a reason to set up a distance. But it's a wondering. Um, I want to just thank Dr. Halpern for the the words of empathic um, curiosity, which it's just great to have words for something which on a really good day I try to do um, as a general internist and as a faculty member, which means I should really be ignored. But my, 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 my question is almost a pathophysiologic one. What What is the role of empathic curiosity for the patient who has personality traits or personality disorder, at least as a major part of the problem. My, my, what I think is probably a Luddite sort of understanding of personality traits, our vision of them as primary care doctors is that they are primal, unexplainable, and that we're not going to get to the bottom need. We're not going to address the bottom line need. And is there a role for the empathic curiosity there? Well, and I, and I think it's likely, again, this is a case that Francis Degnan wrote up. It's not a clinical case I was involved in, so I don't know the actual patient, Lois, but unless this was just the craziest projections in the world, which I doubt, it sounds like Lois probably had a personality disorder. Let's, let's assume she did. And so I think it's a very realistic case in that sense because they said even when she became a functioning, more adult-like member of the community, she still was not an easy patient. So I think that, and the personality disorders have, you know, there's a spectrum of them. There's certain kinds of personality disorders just make people do great altruistic things and they just are very unhappy. But, but most of the ones we talk about in medicine um, are the ones like a narcissistic personality disorder, a borderline personality disorder. And, you know, it, there is, the, I, there's no way that empathy is going to cure that. I will just make that statement and maybe all these psychotherapists will come after me, but um, I just don't think you can cure a really, you know, a very severe, real significant narcissistic or board. I'm, I'm with you in that there's, I'm with the uh, most recent thinking in psychiatry that looks at these as having a biologic as well as um, a familial component, familial in both elements actually, often biologic and upbringing and complex features. And um, they're not as absolutely objectifiable as like bacterial pneumonia but they're looking more and more like there are elements of that. And of course, there's social constructs because, you know, there used to be like hysterical 
you know, personality disorders when there were views of women a certain way. I mean, personality disorders have a cultural overlay, what we consider a personality disorder. So I'm not saying that they're pure biologic entities, but there's an overlay of culture and society and what society can tolerate and, and power issues. And then there's an underlay of biologic elements that make people just very, very vulnerable to rage and not able to soothe themselves very well and to always make use of other people to take out their issues. So you know, let's just say it's a complex mix. So let's say you have adults that are unlikely to suddenly become an easy person. Lois never became an easy person. I think this case shows just what empathy can do, which is basically she still has adult-like parts. She still has mature parts that want to make, she still can, wants to feel well, you know, respected and contribute to society and feel respected as an adult, just like if you had other kinds of disorders. Um, I mean, we now know, I think most people in this room now, we used to look at depression as meaning a person was weak. You know, we used to look at clinic, uh, major depression that way. Mm -hmm. And now, fortunately, we don't do that. Now we understand, we really get it, I think, as caregivers, that you can have a really strong character and be a remarkably selfless and giving human being and have a biologic history of major depression. And when you're in a depression, you're unbelievably self-absorbed and demanding and difficult, whatever. We got, we got that one now. I think we have to sort of go to the same place with personality disorders and recognize that no one is just their personality disorder. It is a part of them that makes them always a bigger challenge. And just like a lot of chronic illness, number one thing is to recognize that we can't cure everybody. And actually, it goes to the resource question that you, you were bringing up, Father John, which is um, I think one reason people always go to resource discussions, well, one thing is it is an easier way to kind of limit our obligations to people that we don't want to be with because they're driving us crazy. But I think a deeply unconscious reason that people get worried about resources with, the, with personality disordered patients is that we, very few people really recognize at the beginning of their careers in healthcare that it may be at the end of our careers that mostly what we did was witness people and accompany them as opposed to cure them. <laughs> It's kind of a really painful thing. I mean, maybe I'm going to upset a lot of people here, but that's how I see healthcare. I don't really think of us as changing and curing people that much, but I think of us as accompanying people. And a lot of that can be true with physical chronic illness, and the same is true with people with personality disorders. But if you're not really set up to do that, if you really only want to get people well at the end of the day, then this feels like a huge drain on your resources. So I'm Kevin from Ethics. Uh, I've seen cases of working with patients who have especially personality disorders, and I've seen the sort of wonders that can often occur with attempts to limit set, not dissimilar to how Mary was described in this case. But without trying to create a posture of unnecessary defensiveness among our providers that every patient who comes into the clinic or who's admitted to the hospital, we have to set limits. There is sometimes some help in trying to accommodate, especially with things that are a little less um, major parts of the care plan to just try to find ways to gain, um, to promote a trusting therapeutic alliance. But I think oftentimes providers get so far past that stage of accommodation that it actually becomes bargaining and negotiating with parents or with patients. And then <laughs> Pediatrics. We, we can laugh at that, right? <laughs> and then it becomes the limit setting is an attempt to regain territory that was lost. And then the struggles just I mean, it's palpable on the units. Um, so I wonder, how can we identify times when we need to start that conversation of, do we need to, as a staff, set some healthy limits? How do we set those limits in a way that's not unnecessarily draconian on the patient, but also is consistent with um, how we're moving forward? W what are some of our thoughts there? Uh, I'll venture a start. <laughs> Um, I think when we start to feel these things, uh, when we start to feel anxiety or anger or frustration, um, that might be a clue that uh, we might be overstretching what we're comfortable with. Um, and maybe it would be the time to pause and, and think, rethink what is our therapeutic relationship and what, what are the boundaries that I'm willing to go to and not willing to go beyond. And uh, in my experience, what I found is we're 
we get to the point of recognizing the boundary that we're not willing to go beyond after we've crossed it. And so, the, you know, having the self-awareness to think about, and that this is this actually, if you look at the business literature on negotiation, they recommend before you enter a negotiation, know when you're willing to walk away from the table. Um, but we end up in these uh, relationships, these therapeutic relationships that become problematic because we haven't thought what is our professional boundary and how far we're willing to go or not go. And I think in terms of when you start thinking more about the how, how the patient may be irritating you or driving you crazy or something, when you get to that point, you know that you're not thinking about what is actually wrong with the patient. And um, that's when you, when you recognize that, you need to step back and say, what is going on with this patient? What am I not seeing? Do I need to have somebody else pay attention to this patient or dialogue with them about what's going on with the patient to get a different perspective? I'd like just to throw out an idea that popped in my head as I was listening to this. Um, you know, when we deal with our patients, it's not unlike dealing with our kids. Mm -hmm. And what my because we have to be present with them, you know. And what my wife and I decided we would do to set boundaries for our kids is when we found that their behavior was turning us into people we didn't like. And so <laughs> that's when we set our boundaries. And I wonder if the same principle might apply here, even though it doesn't sound necessarily professional. I think that's kind of what I meant by knowing, the, knowing that boundary. It's, it's, it's about how do we... What kind of professional do I want to be, and when am I no longer becoming that professional, or when am I no longer acting in a way consistent with that vision? I guess one thing to add to all this discussion so that it doesn't feel like, especially because I think you're right, but I think that it could be mis misconstrued as saying, you know, patients aren't uh, children, we're not, you know what I mean? Uh, so it doesn't want to sound patronizing. And so I think what we're really taught, but I do think that the dynamic you're describing is exactly accurate, and I think the issue here. And that I was trying to, and I talked about this on this morning is basically, you know, we and our patients are co human <laughs> and we're all in the same boat and we're all going to die. We're all afraid about that. We're all afraid of suffering. When we see a patient, like I talked about one this morning that made everybody so afraid that they didn't know they were afraid. Um, this patient also evoked all kinds of feelings, to people about their own dependency needs. So basically, what we're not aware of is. People can only drive us crazy because, I mean, they, you could literally, I guess, ring the bell of the nursing station every minute or something, but I think a, a limit would ultimately be set on that. But people really drive us crazy because of our own stuff. And, and uh, the, the hardest role that caregivers and parents have in common is unlike business negotiations, whether it's the BATNA or whatever, your best <laughs> alternative to a negotiated, you know, you have a thing you can walk away from if you don't like a business negotiation, but the whole idea of being a clinician is, is loyalty and commitment. And it's the idea of being a parent. So when you can't walk away from human suffering that's not only a pain because you, it's out there, but a pain because it's also in here, it can be unbearable. So I think the biggest thing is to recognize that limit setting is not because that person is such a pain. Limit setting is because we have a limited ability to deal with the human condition ourselves, and we need help and support for that. And so we need to seek support. We need to set limits and be, you know, real about that too. And you know, so that that's I think that's why it's not humiliating. It's about our own limitations. All, all of a sudden, <laughs> a bunch of hands. Um, how about the lady in the? I'm um, actually a hospice physician, and we. It doesn't happen that often. Uh, we actually set a fair number of limits around, um, say, use of opioids and behavior towards staff and such. And um, there's an occasional time where, despite all that limit setting, despite multiple interventions, I think um, we're trying to do our best to um, have empathetic curiosity to patients. There's some situations where patients or perhaps families continue to transgress those limits and times at wi in which 
sometimes I think our staff are even um, threatened. And so where I'm going with this is I'm wondering, are, are there times when despite everything we want to do for these people, you know, and we're, we're hospice, we want to take care of these people to the end of their lives. We really want, we feel strongly it's important to do that. But sometimes, you know, there's situations where people continue to yell obscenities and opioids are missing or there's guns in the homes or what have you. So are there times at which we can say, you know, we can't continue to be there anymore? <laughs> I, I, so at the risk of being controversial, I'll say yes. But the burden of proof is on us. And I, I like to think of, when we think of this, and, and usually it comes up in the context of whether we can discharge a patient from service, or I've heard the term firing a patient. Um, think of three things that, that constitute the therapeutic relationship. What is the bond that we have with the patient? What are our shared goals with the patient? And what are our shared uh, care plan? What, what are the interventions? What, what, what are the tasks that we're willing or not willing to do? And there may be circumstances where we just don't have the same goals, or we, we're just not able to come to terms with what they're asking us to do is beyond my scope of competence or my, my, my willingness as a healthcare, pro healthcare professional as I see myself to do. But it often, um, what often gets unspoken or unaddressed are the issues of trust, the issues of uh, empathy, and the issues of safety that formulate that, that one component of bond that we have with the patient. And I, I think we need to start there before we start thinking about goals and care plans. Mm -hmm. I didn't intend that to be a conversation stopper. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, w I welcome uh, others as well. I, want, I just would say that I do think that it's a very hard problem for a hospital system. I think that I kind of am better at figuring out what to do at the individual clinician level. Mm -hmm. I've definitely been involved in a number of consults and situations, and also myself even, where there was something toxic in uh, a patient or family's treatment of the healthcare provider, where it was important to have a different provider provide the care. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that one is, that can be a no-brainer at a certain point. But I think, in other words, I don't think, I think we're, we should, that's why I think we need to work in teams, because we're not all infinitely able to work with everybody. And there, and, and no, I mean, we should not go to work to be abused, you know? And we can't, we can't take care of other people if we, and it's not good for the whole milieu, like hospice, if some, if, you know, if other families and patients witness an abusive patient or family. So there's definitely such a thing as an abusive person. Just we live in a culture with a lot of violence in the culture, so there'll sometimes be somebody in a hospital or hospice setting who's really violent and threatening to people. And if they're not so violent that you have to get the police involved, they still may be so um, emotionally violent that it just can destroy the safe milieu for people to work in. But what you do is a system. I'm looking at the organization of people. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what you know how you deal with it as a system. I was involved in a policy. Years ago at UCLA, the Ethics Committee did this difficult patient or family policy, and it was kind of trying to set grounds for warnings and a kind of observed interaction and ultimately a discharge or transfer. I didn't do the policy. I was just a, a, a new member early this long time ago. But I mean, I, I, I can imagine that there need to be things. The problem is, and especially your Catholic health care system, and I believe in public health care systems and Catholic health, you know, you have missions, so you don't want to say people would have no care anywhere. So I see why it's a dilemma. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's more organizational ideas about this. Yeah. Did you want to? I don't. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Experience with us. Go ahead, Sarah. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Holtzke. Go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, I'm actually changing gears a little. There's an area of circumstance that you were talking about that. Uh, 
turned on. No. Oh, okay. Uh, a circumstance that I've always been interested in is the first one or two days of admission. This is extremely out of context of their lives and often the unknown uh, associated with a lot of anxiety or sometimes uh, depression. <clears throat> I think that it's even uh, worse now that Many patients are admitted to hospitalists, doctors uh, they don't know. It's, they're not admitted by their own physician or they're admitted to the critical care units. Uh, I know the nurses in, in that unit do a tremendous job of getting to know the patient, bonding with them. I think it's so important. Uh, if you inquire into what they feel that uh, first day or so, it's amazing what uh, you might find out, and you can often uh, make them a lot more comfortable. I remember a stoic old man who was just anxious as could be. Turns out he had no friends, no family, but had a dog at home, no one to care for it. Once that was resolved, he just smoothed out. And I think nursing has a tremendous uh, uh, responsibility there to uh, work at that first day or two, and I think our critical care nurses are particularly good at that. Yeah, I think uh, uh, we do try to do that. I think the, all, all the nurses across the board, wherever they're admitted, try to do that. Um, one of the things that I think we have, uh, have had trouble with actually is the time and budget. Budget has affected everybody. When every department is cut across the board, then it's and with whole epic and everything like epic, and, uh, it's just cut into everything. And so we don't have the time that we used to have to be able to sit down and spend that time um, with the patients. We do as much as we can, and we still are doing it. But it is time that we have. Uh, so little of anymore because a lot of the nurses are doing a lot of things where budgets were cut every other departments now the nurses have to pick that piece up and so I think that part of it is we have to find that balance as a as an organization where can you cut and where you can't in order for the the end caregivers the ones that are working with the patients to be able to do the things that we need to do and sometimes that is just time to understand where the patient is coming from, to alleviate their fears, like you're talking about. And then some of these things, I think, um, won't, won't exacerbate into a problem patient. Because it's not just about a patient. I mean, we seem to be narrowing it down to these excessively behavior patients. But it's patients that, like you say, they just come in. They've never been in the hospital before. They, they don't know who their uh, caregivers are. They speak another language. I mean, that's a whole different uh, set of circumstances there, and we have to be able to uh, move between those patients and make each one of them feel like you're safe, you're here, we're going to take care of you. And sometimes it's just the time. We don't have, there's not enough time to do that. Um, just to follow up on oh. something that Dr. Halpern told us this morning, this remembering the 60, um, just remembering that 60 second rule, that 60 seconds of asking the patient something about themselves mm -hmm. and letting them have it. And I'm not good at it. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm, I've, uh, we all carry around things that really stuck with us. And um, I've learned a lot from medical students over the mm -hmm. years because they just have a freshness and openness. And I walked into a patient's room with a medical student. I was going to watch her history and physical. And the guy just lit into us. And clearly, he was not going to talk to us until we got food for him. Mm -hmm. So we, we tried it out. We ordered up his food. We came back. And, and he was still pretty angry. And the student looked at his backpack that had a logo on it and just asked him about the logo. And all of a sudden, he melted. It wasn't his backpack. It was his wife's. She's a horticulturalist. It was a horticulture society. It changed the complete dynamic. And that was less than 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. So I carry it with me. I haven't said I've learned it, but it's something that doctors were taught in medical school and maybe nursing, because you used to have more luxury of time, um, need to be reminded it doesn't take that long. And it's also where working as a team, 
maybe if one person can't have the time, maybe the team, we can build mm -hmm. the structure that had the team has the time. Or mm -hmm. students. Or more students. <laughs> Sarah, did you, you know. I'm Sarah, I'm one of the residents. So I was really interested in the group dynamic of the case example that you provided and how sort of everybody in the group reinforced each other's beliefs. And so it sort of got whipped into frenzy in a way. No one was going to step back and say, well, you know, she's not that bad, because they were really all harping on how bad Lois was together. And sometimes, like, that happens when we're caring for difficult patients. How do you step outside of that and realize that you're into group think? And ultimately, whose responsibility is it to sort of have that picture and be able to be more objective? Uh, I'm interested in what other people have to say about this because I mean it's not I don't have a magic answer but the best thing I think is prevention and I think the, the uh, those a few suggestions I made at the end but if you're a, a team leader uh, one thing you can do is bef you know before you're in a particular situation just over time and this has been written about and so there's some some empirical observation that this works that you just it's a culture where when you do whatever rounding you do or whatever case conferences in nursing rounding in medicine whatever it is that you do when the the team is discussing things and there's everybody all different professions and different levels from students to very experienced professionals a culture where it's expected that people will have different opinions. You promote that. You're like, well this is what I, I mean if the the attending or the person that everyone's looking up to says well, I see this family and patient this way, but I'm wondering, you know, what I'm missing. You know, what else do you all see? It, you just create a culture as opposed to a culture of obedience and, and uh, you know, going along with the group. That seems to help. Uh, one thing we do uh, with n new residents or new students that come in, new student nurses, is we talk from the very beginning that you're just out of school. You're going to remind us of all the things down on the cellular level that we may have forgotten. <laughs> so we can learn from you and you can learn from us to try to uh, develop that culture that it's okay for you to speak up and say what you need to say that to uh, maybe teach us something and we teach you. So it's a two-way street, and that's the kind of culture that we've tried to develop in our unit specifically, that, that everybody has a voice, and yours is just as, as important of, as anyone else's. So we, I think if you can develop that, then, then the new people coming in, no matter where they're from, are more likely to at least say something mm -hmm. if they know they're not going to be shot down. So, An argument has been made that one of the, you know, we hear that first do no harm is one of the principal, uh, principal principles of medical ethics, but an argument has been made for first don't be quiet <laughs> should be uh, a principle uh, of that medical ethics. Was there a hand over here? I have a, a comment. Um, I would love to see us as a medical profession get rid of this thing of labeling patients as difficult patients. Mm -hmm. And I like to translate that to this is a person who has difficult behaviors that I'm not equipped or aware of um, how to deal with them. Mm -hmm. And what that does, I find that people get labeled when you're feeling helpless, hopeless, or afraid. Mm -hmm. And there's other things too. And when, when I can reframe the um, judgment of this person to, boy, this person has some behaviors I'm not equipped to deal with, then I can get curious and I can actually start putting my, empower myself mm -hmm. to re-engage with this person. So I wish as a, as a whole culture, medical culture, that when we catch ourselves or others labeling patients or families as difficult, that we would challenge that and say, gosh, sounds like this is a patient who is challenging you mm -hmm. in order to figure out how to meet their needs. Anyway, that's... Mm -hmm. I think that's a good point. One of the things that I attempt to do is when I, because when I get the referral or when I look in Epic and I see the reason for the consult, I'm often having to interpret these labels, you know, non-compliant patient or difficult patient or difficult family. So I have to pause and say, okay, that's a label. Depend, independent of how accurate it may be in describing the patient, that there's an evaluative dimension to those words that now the patient and or family have been carrying with them from clinical encounter to clinical encounter. So how can I pause and just say, okay, how do I handle that? And sometimes it's when I talk to other clinicians in the process of a consult, I'll acknowledge 
that the patient or whomever is carrying a label of blah, blah, blah. And so just calling it out as a label. But also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, being curious about what is it about the encounter that makes it difficult rather than, um, so that's, that's, a, that's a shift in focus from the patient as difficult or the family member as difficult to what about the encounter is difficult and it helps get the creati creativity moving in, in a way that's not, um, it's non-judgmental and doesn't blame, doesn't put the blame on any one person. Sir? I heard Marsha mentioning I heard Marsha alluding to the fact that we need more time when we're seeing patients, whether from the nursing point of view or the MD's point of view. And uh, time is something of a great value. And I hear a lot of doctors complaining they don't have enough time to see patients when they're worrying about the commuter. I was just talking to a cardiologist that he has to spend two hours every night fixing the computer that he's been using during the day. And ordinarily, he'd be able to go home at 6 or 6.30 in the evening and be with his family. And so he stays late. And I think it's a big problem. However, it should be solved because a few months back, I went to a nice program they had here. Doctors should meditate. <laughs> Ma'am? Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to pick up on what she said about labels. And I think sometimes we forget about what the purpose of a label is. So. You, uh, a diagnosis is a label. You say pneumonia, and everyone knows what that means. It's a set of, it's a set of symptoms, and it helps us know here's what the treatment will be. But I think we've we've taken labels like personality disorders, and instead of using them as a shorthand of oh here's a here's a set of things that we know about this person and what they can tolerate, what they can't, how we might care for them. Sometimes in healthcare, I think that becomes a justification for dismissing them or not meeting their needs or whatever that might be. So I've gotten to the point where I am very cautious <laughs> um, before putting anything in access to in a chart because I'm afraid of that's what will happen to the person. Instead of sort of dissecting that and saying, okay, well, let's think about what it means to be a borderline and how miserable it is to be a borderline and why people get, you know, nobody wants to be this way. <laughs> um, and I think sometimes bringing in a consultant or having someone be able to step back and just kind of give us some understanding of why it is people are the way they are versus they're willfully ruining our day or not letting us get home to our families on time, whatever. Yeah, I just, I just want to add one thing tying in a lot of comments about resources and time and um, just that it's just sad because it's basically you can and the family analogies you can imagine like in a very in a very supportive community or family where there's lots of everybody's feeling supported there's a lot of energy to deal with members that have differences and maybe take a certain amount of uh, high, you know high input and in a very limited and overly stressed system there, that tolerance just goes away and I think that's part of what is happening with our healthcare system. Um, in, in context to being a, being a nurse, you know, like yesterday I was floated to different floors on my 12-hour shift. I just realized I need to say something. I need to ask for help, you know. And there's a charge nurse. There's other nurses that are not busy. And I have to admit three patients. And there's that section that we have to finish in the first four hours of the admission. And those are the important things that we need to know about the patient. What are your anxieties? Is there somebody that needs to be taken care of at home? Those are very important uh, questions that we need to ask and we need to know in the first four hours of an admission. And yesterday I was able to to pass it on to other nurses who can help me because I, I, I guess, you know, three of these patients came in um, direct to bed from the doctor's office and they have concerns and they have anxieties, you know, and, and I think as nurses speaking, I would suggest that, you know, we have a church nurse, we have other people that can help us and it's just a matter of asking is, is important. Yeah. Well, Mary, Mary you to Lois sounds like a Zen meditation to me. Uh, Mary didn't neglect or run away from the cry of uh, Lois, but wasn't pulled by her frantic anxiousness or the caregivers. I think that keeping that health boundary 
is important because empathy is not apathy nor sympathy. So, and also there are, in clinical relationship, there are always parallel going on. So when we have that uh, good uh, boundary, we'll be able to provide that healthy distraction to the, to the pa uh, patient. Well, I love that comment. I have to say, I'm personally really interested in, in the comment about, and learning about, you know, the different kinds of uh, Buddhist practices for compassion. And they really relate to this model that I've always believed in of engaged curiosity, because the model I've, I've been trying to articulate, which has been so much more beautifully developed as practices and various Buddhist practices, including Zen, it's really sort of watching your own mind and watching other people's minds, but with, with, with concern, not, in this, not detached in the sense that you're an automata, but you feel your feelings, but you know your feelings will come and go, and you feel other people's feelings, but you see that they'll come and go. So that idea that things will shift, I mean, that's about the most relieving thing. I mean, literally, we work in shifts, right? Mm -hmm. And one way we survive in a day like you were having yesterday is we know a shift will end. <laughs> Otherwise, we would never be able to do these jobs that we do. So and it's the same thing with affect and feeling and intensity, even the saddest things. Is, you know, I think that's part of maturity, too. Sister Linda? Um, just a comment. Um, I've heard uh, frequently the expression of, of what is the professional responsibility, what is the, the profession, uh, what, who is the professional. And um, I was struck, uh, often I'm asked that, uh, what does it mean to be a professional or in the healthcare professions? And my understanding is that a group um, is honored to be a profession if they have a well-articulated code of ethics as well as being highly certified, educated, and qualified. But you, this morning, when you um, described um, professionalism, I was struck by the, um, the, the a better understanding of the word. Um, and sometimes we know something by the, by the lack of it. <laughs> and uh, the description of a failure of professionalism as when I am acting out without knowing what is going on within me, uh, that struck me as really a very important way of honoring the ethics of the healthcare professions, just as Simon was speaking, of knowing who I am. And often, for me, I find out that it's the buttons that are being pushed in me because that person has exactly the same misguided personality or whatever you want to say. <laughs> but I, I was just so struck with that, is acting out without knowing what is going on within myself that uh, is truly unprofessional, and it's not a matter of detachment or clinical objectivity or some of the other kind of whatever we're talking about when we talk about the privilege of being part of a profession. I think we have, do you have the, that, are those available to people? Well, we don't have, we haven't, we haven't thought about it. We definitely have one out there that people can look at. But, and you can, and we have, from, was it from Oxford? I brought order forms yeah. to give it, when I give a talk, you get a 10 or 15% discount or something, so I bring the order forms. <laughs> but you have that. I, I'd yeah. I, if you yeah. do read it and you disagree or have thoughts of things I left out, email me and let me know. <laughs> I mean, where, where will they be? They're on the table, but you register that. Thank you. Yes. I have a question about um, bluntness and, and honesty. Because um, I've often wondered, you know, uh, the re it is a relationship. It's not, you know, just sort of a doctor and a patient down here or a nurse. And, um, and what is the role for sometimes being honest with somebody about how they're making you feel? Well, I'll just give you, I'm just, I mean, it's a little bit light on that. I have an example that I didn't want to give in my, my talk is not, it's a little bit uh, improper. I don't know how to put it better than that. <laughs> but uh, I just, I've got to use it because it's an example, because it's, it's just so exact about how much we feel like we have to be different, like we, can't, we have to be, pretend we're not human in a way. Uh, and so it was an example that a psychotherapist gave me where she had a patient who, 
if, if she didn't like start the patient at the very first second, if she was like one second late in calling the patient into the waiting room, the patient would get really mad at her. And this would just happen week after week and the patient would yell and yell and be critical and she would be very, you know, what she thought was professional, you know, listening and whatever. And one time she couldn't help it, she blurted out, I had to go to the restroom. And this patient who was pretty, you know, had this label of narcissistic personality disorder and all this stuff, just like was so surprised that she was so revealing and that she talked about herself as a human being that way. And she just was sort of taken aback and the whole therapy got going because she realized that she was putting people under un unrealistic pressure and she started to realize how perfectionistic she was with others and then she started to realize how hard really she was also on herself and how grandiose her expectations were and I mean the whole therapy took off because of that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Because that um, could be embarrassing for. Right, but it doesn't say with a. Yeah. It doesn't say, I dread coming in your room. I, I think that with once you. I mean, I, I really appreciate, Sister, you bringing up the point about professionalism as knowing you know, where you're coming from. So I think the biggest issue, the it, psychotherapists, this is not my idea. I mean, I was taught by my teachers of psychotherapy, and I don't even know who originated this thought. But you know, when you make interpretations, when you're doing psychotherapy, you get you say things to people that can be hard to hear. You know, that can like you know you. Uh, it sounds like you're in a way treating your husband like he's a child or something. You know, something that could be seen as very difficult. Once you have a really good therapeutic relationship with someone, as a therapist, you might say things that are kind of hard on another person, right? Mm -hmm. So we learn, you know, never say that in anger. Never make an interpretation because this is where psychotherapists. A lot of times they don't realize that they make all these interpretations that are pretty cutting because they're pissed off at the patient. I mean, then they can do a lot of damage. So a big learning in psychotherapy and psychiatry is to know always sort of where you're coming from. So I mean, my advice would be not to let someone know they're bothering you when you're furious because it's, you know, if you don't have to. I mean, of course, if, you're, if there's a danger or risk, and we talked this morning just about, or at, we talked at resident rounds about just a patient, a uh, family member who won't let the nurses go in and start the IV and standing there and badgering them. I mean, again, we have to set, we're allowed to do things to make it a safe workplace and say, I'm sorry, I really need to ask you to step aside right now and even to call security and, do, you know, whatever. But once it's a safe situation and it's not a crisis, Crisis, that's the time to go take those deep breaths first and you know really know where you're coming from and what your goal is and once you know where you're coming from what your goal is I do think especially if you're gonna have ongoing care of a patient or family I think it, it's better to let them know and because they usually know anyway and to sort of say you know look you probably have noticed that the whole staff is starting to kind of avoid all of you and I think what's happening is people are feeling really overwhelmed and I think we need to come up with a plan of regular daily meetings where we'll check in with you for in the ICUs or whatever. I mean I want to know what the people on the what you think because you're doing it more than me now. But you know something like that. What, what, what do you think? Yeah. I think uh, actually just uh, the other day when a patient was we had a patient like that that was um, yelling out for more meds and those kind of things and the nurse went in and just had the conversation listen. We have a sick patient next door that's very sick that's trying to get some rest and you're yelling out. You have a call light right there. You just call us and we'll come in. Uh, what's going on that you feel like you need to yell? And then um, they just had a dialogue that he was just afraid. He wasn't sure what was going on. He hadn't quite understood the explanation of, that the physician had given him about what was going on with, um, with him and his care. And so it was just a matter of that. He goes, you're right, I'm sorry, I won't be doing that anymore. I mean, it doesn't always happen that way, certainly, but certainly if you take a moment to find out what's going on with that, you can, and, and just be straightforward. He was pretty straightforward, like, you're disturbing the patients, we can't be doing this. Um, I just can I add one thing and then I want to hear what you have to say, but one of the um, trainees was saying today at our resident rounds, very important though, use, using I statements. If you're gonna give somebody negative feedback about your being mm -hmm. uh, exhausted or something, then keep, be honest, say, I'm feeling exhausted right now. Um, I have a f I'm feeling like we're going in circles. 
Mm. I'm I'm at the I'm at the I'm feeling like I'm losing patience and I need a break or but you know not you're a border or you know what I mean so I mean not that <laughs> not that we would do that but I mean if if it's really and there's a good a good thing about I statements besides the fact that they don't shame people which is the main thing mm -hmm. is they also can't be disputed you can't lose with an I statement with somebody's going to because if you say you're asking too much of us because, you know, whatever. They can say, well, I haven't really asked that much, and then you're still talking to them. But if you say, I need a break right now, I'll be back in a little while, most people will accept it. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, that's fine. Uh, yeah. Heather? Um, I would just, you know, I, I think um, one thing I would add about the I statement is in the context of what we're talking about, truly understanding ourselves and our needs and our motivations is that when we use I statements that we, we actually really mean them yeah. because I statements you know, are so rote now that we can actually still really be blaming the other. And I feel like you're being a pain in the neck. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and so it's just that work of you know, feeling comfortable just knowing and identifying your own needs and, and being able to speak to that authentically. Which, again, the whole profession tells us we're not supposed to have it. And I think even more in nursing than in, I mean, there's so much pressure not to acknowledge need. So, I was just going to add um, that after you take the deep breath and you recognize what that emotional state that you're in, attend to what, you know, so I'm think, thinking of this in the context of an ethical tension. What is it, the, the ethical tension? You know, anger might represent an injustice on some level. Shame might represent um, a feeling of disconnect or, or uh, being an outsider. Guilt might feel like I need to reconcile. Um, and then making it safe and, you know, sort of a, a formula that I've heard that works well, um, and it's, it, it, it's worked well in, for me in, in some, certain contexts, which is describing what you observed, you know, the behaviors that are causing you to feel a certain way, describing what you expect, and then uh, working towards a mutual solution um, in between that, the, the gap of those, of those things. Dr. English, and this will be our last question. Um, this discussion has brought to mind <clears throat> the question about the bi-directionality of doing medical consultations, which I'd like to address to Dr. Halpern and Nick specifically. And it's, I just reflected back, when I was a hospitalist, um, I was really challenged by patients who came in with borderline personality disorder. And I discovered initially, I was asking behavioral health to come in to help fix the problem. But after a while, I actually was asking them to come in to help me deal with the patient and with the nursing team to deal with the patient. and it, and all of a sudden, I was basically turning it upside down because suddenly the patient was getting billed for something that wasn't the patient's benefit directly, <laughs> but it was really for me that I was asking, um, you know, help. And and later, when I was doing palliative care, I discovered that in palliative care, an awful lot of our focus, honestly, was to help the referring team understand the patient better. Mm -hmm. So. Part of our culture and part of our opportunity for cultural transformation is to begin to understand how we use our medical consults. Because I still think the prevailing feeling is it's for the patient. And that's true for my ID consults, for my general internal medicine consults, certainly how I use cardiologists and nephrologists, it's all for the patient's benefit. But for ethics, for psychiatry, and for palliative care, it's for our presence with the patient that makes a difference because we're the medicine. So how does that work, and how do we really think about it? And in the consults you do, how intentional is it that the team is asking you to help them rather than just to fix the patient? And, and how do we think about that you know, ourselves? I'll just answer very briefly from the, in the Providence context, that's one of the main reasons why we approach ethics consultation not strictly as advisement, but as an opportunity for coaching. How ought we be thinking about the case, uh, the care of this patient, and what are some questions that I need to ask myself? And I find myself in the role of the ethicist wondering, can't we get behavioral health to come in and give us some coaching about how to uh, approach care uh, of this particular patient or family? Well, I'm looking at Father John. I know if you want to say anything about it, because what <laughs> I, was, I was very impressed by the model you've developed and you all have through the years of this particular 
health system and this particular ethics service because it's exactly that kind of model. And that's not, I mean, that's not typical in bioethics. So that's exactly what I think you all are doing, which is working with the team to help them think with you all about and, and more. What about using behavioral health in the same way? Well, I, I actually, I mean, I think that it probably depends, again, on how good a system and how open everybody is to it. But I, I am asked that at that level. And the systems I've been in, I, I, I've been able to help get, but I'm not, there, I, I, that was the one time I was really, that was when I was really involved, very, as you are, you know, very regularly, where people started to get used to thinking it was actually help, like they wanted to call for a consult because they knew it would help the team feel better. Um, and sometimes, I mean, people want psych consults, but they want, they always want, around the country at least, they want psych to get rid of the patient, <laughs> you know, take them to the psych hospital or, or get, or sedate them or, you know, something. Mm -hmm. But, but I do think that you can, that would be a, cult, a, a hospital by hospital culture probably. I think you're 100% right though, that that's what's needed. But you've done that with ethics here, I think. Well, thank you all very much for your uh, participation and, and presence. And thank you to Dr. Halpern yeah, and Marsha for- <laughs>